So, aside from first blood being drawn between incompetent villains and so-called heroes, what else does the show offer us as we attend the Festival of the Fall, parts 1 and 2? As the name would suggest, it's a time of celebration in Lingarf. This citywide jamboree is held in honor of... to celebrate... Um... Autumn time? It's Halloween, basically. Jack-o'-lanterns, everyone dressed in silly outfits, spooky attractions, even the diegetic music has this obvious ghoulish flair to it. It's just Halloween by a different name. This here is the most obvious, immediate example of a certain amateurish world-building trope, one that I've left alone so far. The all-encompassing term is anachronism, which in essence refers to a juxtaposition between the time period and any specific element within that does not belong there. For example, if you were to write a story set in Victorian London, and you had a character suddenly whip out a cell phone, that would be considered a anachronistic element. Mind you, we are obviously assuming that the story in question is a realistic historic tale, and not some kind of alternate history fantasy whatever punk story. Now the emergence of anachronistic elements is not immediately a failing in the story, if it's used purposefully, a surrealistic comedy, for example, could make great use of mixing and matching all kinds of contrasting characters and situations to accentuate whatever joke they are going for. The problem with High Guardian Spice implementing clear modern-day elements in its narrative is that the world itself is modeled after classic high fantasy conventions, rural architecture, low industrialization, ropes and wizard hats, stuff like that. That's the basic aesthetic. It has nothing to do with our modern day culture, so then, when the show all of a sudden introduces story elements and world building poached from our modern day society, and just dumps them in without rhyme or reason, it leaves the world as an incoherent mess. There is no purpose behind anything, no history, no culture in the world, the writers just wanna have a Halloween episode, so this world suddenly celebrates Halloween now. It feels artificial and forced, and frankly childish. Other examples of anachronism in this show include stuff like clothing and the way people talk. The fashion of this universe has no through line, absolutely zero thought is given to functionality or cohesiveness. Everyone just wears whatever the hell the character designer gave them. Time has a green tunic a la Legend of Zelda. Rosemary wears her trademark frilly pink dress everywhere, even in dangerous dungeon trips. Anise has this basic bitch too cool for school punk street look. And it's not like these are the clothes of certain cultures. It's not consistent. No one else dresses like Anise. No one else dresses like Rosemary. The NPCs in the streets have basic feudalistic peasant clothes, but then at the ending credits of the series, we have a totally awesome shopping trip, where the girls try on far more modern, fashionable clothing. Is the reigning fashion in Lingar this? Or is it this? It can't be both at the same time. But the creators think this is cute or whatever, so now it just exists in the show. The fact that the Academy has anime-inspired school uniforms is a joke in and of itself. Though to be fair, I'm extending this particular criticism to every single light novel battle school crap fest as well. Just because your assumed audience gets their rocks off watching cute girls in short skirts is no reason to make your world building fundamentally nonsensical. It's a ye old fantasy world, the students are training to be warriors, why are they dressed in stuffy school uniforms? Especially since the purpose of these outfits is to level the herd, to uniform everyone, literally. But the academy just lets everyone wear whatever they goddamn please on official quests, instead of some kind of specialized guardian armor. Everyone is allowed to express their individuality, so why are there uniforms in the classroom? It makes no sense. 
the only reason to have them is literally because anime. And that is a horrid reason to write anything. Now the single worst character sticking out like a sore thumb after too much click diddling is Anis. Aside from the way she dresses, her speech pattern is also bewildering. She talks like a wine aunt trying to sound like a 15 year old. Or at least what she thinks 15 year olds talk like in our world in the 90s. I feel... odd. What's wrong, Tiger? Sweetheart, we're so sorry. Yeah, dude. We didn't want to freak you out. We just wanted to help you with this huge, crazy shift. Your mom went through a phase where she really dug new magic. I looked up to her because of it. She was a badass. After a few years, she stopped using it and went back to her roots. <laughs> but she pretends that she never deviated, even a little. And that's not fair to you. <sighs> I know, right? Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> no one else acts like this. The dialogue is all around awful, so this is not anything special. Just another specific way the show fucks up everything and anything humanly possible. Further mismatched elements include things such as technology. There are steam powered locomotives. There are apparently cameras, though we never actually see one in action. There are no telephones, nor is there any kind of easily accessible spell equivalent of that, as we learn in a later episode. Okay, so we have an approximate idea of the technological advancement in this universe. There's plenty of room to poke and prod at this already, especially considering the amazing feats magic can accomplish. The world should look a whole lot different. But let's leave it at that, lest I lose the rest of my waning sanity. Instead, let's take a look at this enormous fuck you to world building. This fantasy world with magic, and dragons, and cobblestone streets, and crank operated gondolas motorized with troll power, and absolutely no computers, suddenly has VR technology used exclusively to play a shitty children's tower defense game, ignore all the obvious extremely useful possibilities, training the guardians for serious missions in a realistic yet safe environment comes to mind. Nope, children's games, of course. So the logic and mechanics of this crap are utterly broken, the classes are not hooked into any kind of device, they activate just by slapping them on your face, they somehow scan your entire body and attire to create this chipified version of you wearing the exact clothes currently on you. It scans your body through your eyes. And to play the game, you have to physically move around, walk, run, roam throughout the city, except the times that you don't. The show can't even keep this consistent. How the fuck is anyone supposed to play this game amidst the bustling festival? Anyone dumb enough to take part in this farce would constantly bump into people, most likely stumble into some alley, probably get kidnapped and end up on some slave ship heading for the Triumvirate's private Epstein Island. Fuck this is dumb. The game itself is a basic defense mission against this giant monster bunny. Stop it before it destroys your home base for some reason modeled after the Guardian Academy, simple enough. There's also a secondary objective of freeing citizens from ice, for no directly apparent reason, points maybe. So Amaryllis and Snapdragon managed to fail at this children's game, repeatedly to the point of frustration. At the end, Parsley is kind enough to share the secret pro-gamer strats with the struggling duo, this game is all about teamwork. But we were... They... Were working together. <sighs> What's the secret? Two winning choices. One, work together to defrost all of the students and they'll join you in beating the monster and saving the school. Two, share the fireballs and defeat the monster with a double attack before she freezes anyone. Huh, <laughs> complex for a kid's game. This is absolutely horrid game design. The whole point of class-based games is that everyone has their own role, people are different, 
Everyone likes contributing in different ways. Some like offense, some enjoy support roles. The brilliance of team mechanics is that everyone has their own part to play and everyone has to trust each other to pull their weight. When all the pieces fall into place and the team works like a well-oiled machine, that is satisfying. Forcing everyone to adopt a single role beats the whole purpose of different classes existing. The message here tries to be some after-school special shite about teamwork and sharing. But that message would already be readily implemented if the show just followed the principles widely present in most video games. I just hope that the person responsible for this backwards ass idiocy never finds a place in the gaming industry. Introducing lame Spice Legends, the fastest growing, most popular gacha shitfest this side of the Pacific. Looking for a generic fantasy world? You got it! Battles that are equal parts luck and skills pulled out of the writer's collective ass? It's fantastic! Play with characters ranging from no personality at all to absolute cunts! All of them shamelessly stolen from other properties with no cohesion whatsoever! Play it, consume it, love it! And if you don't like it, well we'll just call you a racist, sexist, pineapple on pizza phobe and never improve because fuck you! Watch it! And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for listening till the end. The continued support is very much appreciated. And a special thanks goes to all the supporters on Patreon. As well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaya Vanderwatt and Six Stars. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.